Welcome everybody here today. Today we gather in the city of Turku to talk about if Jesus rose from the dead. My name is Tony Heikla and I'm, study, I'm studying theology here at Obo Academy University. Today I represent the local team organizing Veritas Forum at Obo Academy University. Veritas Forum Finland is a network that organizes academic discussions about the big questions of the life on university campuses across Finland. We operate in Finnish, Swedish and English. The Veritas Forum events originated at Harvard University in 1992. Since then, over 200 universities in North America, Europe and Asia have hosted the events. In Finland, the events are coordinated by Christian student organization Studentmissionen or OPCO or IFES Finland. Everybody should have received a feedback paper at the door. Please fill it in and leave it by the door when you leave. This helps us to organize even better forums in the future. The film from today's debate will be published on Veritas Forum Finland channel on YouTube and also on the website veritasforum.fi. After the forum, everybody are welcome to, to the Koulu restaurant at Erik in Katu, 18. There, Stefan Gustafsson will continue to talk about and answer questions about the team, who was Jesus. There will also be some re refreshments after the event at Koulu. Today, our moderator is Sven Ola Bak. He's a university lecturer in biblical language and exegesis here at Albo Academy University. Once again, welcome. The stage is yours. See you in the air. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of the discussion uh, this afternoon is phrased as a question, namely, did Jesus rise from the dead? And there are, as you understand, two speakers in alphabetic order, uh, Stefan Gustafsson and Matti Myllikoski. Mr. Gustafsson is the director of Apologia, Centrum for Christian Apologetic, Center <coughs> of Christian Apologetics, Apologetics uh, meaning the depiction and defense of Christian faith. Uh, he's a Master of Divinity from Lund University, Sweden, and the author of several books, among others, Christen på goda grunder, Christian on Solid Ground. This is a work, by the way, which has been uh, translated into several uh, languages, including Finnish. Among his other books, I will just mention Gör som Gud, Bli Människa, uh, in English, God's Guide to Becoming Human. Mr. Myllikoski is a docent, a little bit tricky title, docent, uh, docent of New Testament exegesis at the University of Helsinki. Exegesis meaning the critical examination and elucidation of texts. One of his publications is called Die letzten Tage Jesu, Markus und Johannes, ihre Traditionen und die historische Frage, which will be in English, The Last Days of Jesus, Mark and John, their traditions and the historical question. This work consists of two volumes, the first of which was Dr. Milikowski's doctoral dissertation that he defended in 1991 at Helsinki University. Among his other works, I will just mention his and Dr. Lehtipo's translation into Finnish of the writings of Saint Justin the Martyr. 
apologiat ja dialogi trifonin kanssa. The structure of the debate is as follows. First, each speaker delivers his introductory address. Uh, it's 15 minutes each on the theme of the discussion. Then the speakers will comment on each other's arguments, eight minutes each. And finally, there are short concluding comments by each speaker, three minutes each. After these comments by the speakers, uh, you ladies and gentlemen will have the possibility to ask questions relating to the topic under discussion. At about 6 p.m. or maybe 6.15, we should reach the end of this, this, this uh, occasion. And we, of course, all hope that uh, at the exit we'll, we'll be a little bit wiser than uh, we were at the entrance. So, our first speaker then is uh, Mr. Gustafsson. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to uh, this dialogue. Thank you for uh, coming out to uh, listen to us and uh, be, uh, to be a part of this important discussion on the uh, resurrection of Jesus. And thank you, Mati, for uh, agreeing to be part of this dialogue. I think we need much more of these kinds of dialogues in our society today to discuss uh, the important issues and challenge each other's thinking in order to gain a deeper understanding. And this afternoon, the subject is, of course, the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> I will try to summarize my position in a number of points. First, when we approach this issue, did Jesus rise from the dead? The whole issue of our presuppositions will become very important. If there is no God, of course dead people cannot come alive. And if dead people cannot come alive, of course Jesus did not come alive. I, I see that logic. So if there is no God, of course no resurrection. But if there is a God, then of course dead people, it's possible that dead people can come alive. And therefore it's possible that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's even like this that it's enough to say it's possible that there is a God, then it follows it's possible that God can raise dead people, and then it's possible that Jesus was resurrected by God from the dead. And then, if you're open for that possibility, the possibility of the existence of God, you need to do some historical investigation. Did God actually resurrected Jesus from the dead. It's important to see that when the first Christians talked about the resurrection, they always, you can read all the sermons in the book of Acts, they always made their presupposition clear. They never said, Jesus rose from the dead. They always said, God raised Jesus from the dead. So, making clear their starting point, their assumption that there is a God, the God of Israel, who is the God of the whole world, the creator of the universe. To quote C.S. Lewis, but if we admit God, must we admit the miracle? Indeed, indeed, you have no security against it. That is the bargain. So, if anyone is um, interested in discussing this whole issue of the existence of God, of course we can, we can do that, because that is at the foundation of this whole discussion. Secondly, what kind of claim is it from the Christian faith when we talk about Jesus and what happened after his burial? Is it a talk about a resuscitation, or is it a resurrection of the body? This is very important to have clarity. A number of people were coming back from the dead, according to the Gospels, Lazarus being the most famous one. They were resuscitated back to their previous life, and then they died a few years later. Nothing actually dramatic happened. 
their day of death just were postponed a few years. This is not what we are talking about. The first Christians were very clear that the resurrection of Jesus was an absolute, unique event and very different from what happened to Lazarus and the other that was res uh, resuscitated through Jesus' ministry. Paul talks in the book of Acts that Messiah was the first to rise from the dead. So in this sense, Jesus was the first one. The unique thing was that he was not given his old deadly life back, but that God glorified him. And that glorification meant, amongst other things, that he now cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. So this is a unique resurrection into a new, upgraded form of bodily human existence, which is now not subject to death any longer. So this is what we are talking about. Has this kind of resurrection happened within our history with Jesus of Nazareth? Notice, it is resurrection of the body. In the Jewish context, everyone understood resurrection as a bodily event, not a spiritual event. Not something happening to the soul only, but happening to the body. And amongst the Jewish people, they were waiting for the day of resurrection at the end of history. For the surrounding culture, this was a very provocative concept. The the Greeks and the Romans, they thought of the soul living on after the body has died. And they mocked the first Christians when they talked about a bodily resurrection. So in, in uh, Athens, it says when Paul talks about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. They couldn't take this concept in of a bodily resurrection. And in Acts 26, Paul himself challenges his hearers and says, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? So we are talking about not a spiritual event only, but an event involving the real actually, actual body of Jesus of Nazareth. The background for this event is, of course, the crucifixion of Jesus and the burial of Jesus that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and that he was actually buried. The theory that some theologians, like Bart Ehrman, uh, have said that Jesus was not buried does not bear up to historical scrutiny. Josephus, in the, uh, his book, The Jewish War, talks about how the Romans throw, throw some of the people they have crucified into kind of mass graves, but he then says, although the Jews used to take so much care of the burial of men, that they took down those who were condemned and crucified and buried them before the going down of the sun. And this, of course, is in line with what is said in the law, that you have to bury also someone who has been crucified. So Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and then we have the three basic historical facts that the majority of scholars agree on. That the tomb was found empty a few days after the crucifixion. Then that a huge number of people had appearances that they interpreted as if Jesus had come back <coughs> alive. And these appearances caused a dramatic change in their whole outlook of life, a permanent change and it started the Christian church. And those who have had those appearances were willing to die for the new belief they now had that God had raised Jesus. These are the three most foundational facts we need to discuss. The empty tomb, where's the body? The appearances, what actually happened to all those people? And the change, why were they so dramatically changed? The appearances are, of course, crucial amongst those three facts. What happened? Was it visions? Well, you can say that about one of the witnesses, Paul. Paul talks about it as a vision in Acts 26. But Paul is an exception. He has the appearance of Jesus more than a year after the crucifixion and burial, after the ascension of Jesus, and he has a vision. 
but all the other appearances during the 40 days after the, the crucifixion, they were of a different kind. The first Christians were not strangers for visions and dreams, but this was something different. All the testimonies are about something very empirical, where all the senses are functioning. There are references to, to the objective space-time realities. They see, they hear, they touch, they talk, they walk with, they eat together with the risen Christ. It's not subjective inside here, it's objective outside here. And Luke summarized it. He gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. These testimonies come from a number of named individuals, not anonymous, and not only the expected individuals, a number of women who are the first and most profound witnesses, some skeptics and critics, like the Lord's brother, James, and later on Paul, who was a critic of the movement. He appeared to small groups of people, two people on the, down, the road to Emmaus, smaller groups of seven of the disciples, five, five of them are named at the Sea of Galilee, larger groups of maybe 20 persons, and at one event, a crowd of more than 500 people at the same time. The result of this was extremely surprises. Surprising. There were other messianic pretenders during the first century. Judas from Galilee, Simon Bar Giora, or Bar Kochba, they all claimed to be the Messiah and they were, they were executed by the Romans. And their movements died the moment they died. Because to be executed by the Romans was an absolute proof that you were not the Messiah. The really surprising thing is that Jesus was executed by the Romans. And that strengthened the movement. Even though his disciples shared the same view that Messiah should redeem Israel, liberate it from the Roman oppression. So they were as disappointed as all the other messianic movements had been when their leader was executed. But then a short time after, everything changes. And the death of their master gave the movement new energy and new joy? What is the explanation for that? Why did I suddenly have a new understanding of the whole concept of resurrection? In the Jewish context, resurrection is on the last day at the end of history. Now suddenly the Christians say, but for one person, it's in history. He's the first one and he will be followed by everyone who believes in him. Why this suddenly reinterpretation of the concept of resurrection? And then why the growth of the church? How come it suddenly just explodes? Notice that what's sometimes called the Jerusalem factor. Everything we're talking about happened within the city. The crucifixion, the burial, the empty tomb, the appearances, the first public proclamation. It means it was possible for the first generation to investigate. It happened all in Jerusalem, not in a city far away, some other country. And it was in that city the movement started and grew. So, here is the number of the, uh, of, uh, the events and factors we need to keep in mind. Our background philosophy, the claim of what a resurrection is, the basic facts of the empty tomb, the appearances and the growth of the church, the nature of the appearances, that it was not vision or dreams, the result that those who had the appearances were changed <coughs> for the rest of their lives, and that all this took place in the city of Jerusalem. So, what is the best explanation to this sequence of events and to the basic facts that scholar agrees on? the empty tomb, the appearances, the growth of the church. Well, my evaluation is that the best explanation to what we can know from history is that God actually raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you.
was very clear that was a very uh, taking position. And uh, now, since you know everything is talk, you know, has a context. You know, ways of presenting a question like this are manifold. And I think you are accustomed to Stephen's presentation, and and you know about what to think about it. So I'm an, in in a diffi uh, different position here because I'm actually not an opponent. I'm not an atheist. Uh, I'm a theologian, but that doesn't mean uh, doesn't guarantee anything of my position. I could be an atheist, and I could debate with you on those terms. But I am a Christian. But maybe the difference is that I am not evangelical. Uh, I am not apologetically oriented. I come from quite a different perspective. I have a journey with my faith. Uh, I have passed as a or or a present to as a biblical scholar, and uh, my position in gospel studies is is a bit more critical than yours. And in some questions, I may may ask back. Um, so basically. I must tell you first, what I told Stefan before we came here, that I find it um, as a sort of challenge in, in the whole history of Christianity that the dogmatic position of, of you know, the building of Christian doctrine, defending it with sword even and, and, and fighting for it, uh, was the backbone of whole Christian thinking up to the Reformation and beyond that. So institutionalized church was bound to the truth and the doctrine and sort of something you can debate and something you fight for. But then from the times of Reformation, there was another stream of Christianity which was more ethical. It was something you may know as liberal theology from the 19th century, something as the sort of... Um, uh, learned Reformation, Erasmus of Rotterdam and others from time before that, and maybe you can still see in political forms of theologies something of that ethical stream of Christianity. Now, my problem is that that history of church has been a fight between these two, and it's still even today, and I think what you could expect at this podium that you would hear Stefan or someone like he talking for the doctrine and listen to somebody who talks for a uh, philosophy that is not so Christian in traditional sense, but more ethical and modern and more like secular one. Well, that's not my position. My, my position to that um, tragedy, what I would call a tragedy in Christianity, is that there is a third stream that has been. It's a spirituality. And it has been... Of course, a very important part of the doctrine of Christianity and ethical Christianity, but it has never taken a lead of the whole thing. It was always either the doctrinal Christianity or the ethical Christianity, what was first in this troika, and then the second violin was played by the other two. But if you imagine that the key question is spiritual, then you see you can make a different point of view to the whole question. So I'm trying to give you just a scratch of this basic position that I have concerning the question of Jesus' resurrection. Um, I, I see here some questions that are not to be answered, but to lived with. So when we live with the resurrection of Jesus, we live with the risen Jesus, and we live with his whole message and the all ideas that have been de developed about Jesus. You know, when we ask, was this Jesus really? We are actually meaning the question, is this really Jesus? And then we are relating it to everything we know and think and assume about Jesus. And that is a problem. There is nobody to tell you who Jesus really was. But he is ours. He belongs to everybody. He belongs to Catholics, Orthodox, Catholics, yes. Orthodox, he belongs to humanists. He belongs to everybody. There is no single community like there was in the Middle Ages of, of Roman Catholicism to control all the believers about what they believe about Jesus. 
And no, I'm a bit bypassing your questions because you are very specific. But I'm coming to that. I, you, want, you must see where I come from. About, you know, everything is related to Jesus about, you know, his resurrection. And for the first Christians, what really was related to Jesus about his resur resurrection was his promise of the kingdom. Because Jesus, and this is incontestable, he preached the coming of the kingdom of God and he preached it in terms of this kingdom coming soon in the lifetime of his hearers. He did not expect to have us here debating about his resurrection 2,000 years later. He expected like others, and I, I don't take this as a, mess, uh, as a mistake of a divine person or something. I take it as natural that Jesus is located in his time, and he is still the reason Jesus. Because for me, and, and that is my position all the way through, the resurrection of Jesus is a mystery. And what with the mystery, I don't mean something that it's something obscure, we shouldn't think about that, and let's be just rational, but let's give a nod to the faith. No, I don't mean that. I mean that the spiritual questions, truly spiritual questions, start when all the other questions are treated or handled. They start in emptiness. They start when we are alone. And they start when we die. And this is actually, the spirituality is, a, is the space where you are alone with God. And you don't debate with anybody anymore. You don't try to convince anybody, not even yourself. But you are just there like a little child, or a corpse, or a dying old person. It's, it's God's, and now I'm preaching a bit too. You know, it's God's, big thing about God is, that he strips everything off what we have. We come to this world naked and we live naked. And that's spirituality. Now I'm giving you the basics of what I think. And I relate the resurrection of Jesus to that question. And when I relate it to everything about Jesus. So the kingdom did not come, but the faith prevailed. The church came, as Albert Loisy says. So, and I don't see there a sort of, no, ha, 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 no, so, uh, where is his kingdom? You say he's risen, but he said there is a kingdom, it comes, but it hasn't come. So, let's close the whole business. No, I don't see it like that. But after Jesus' resurrection, his kingdom, that was about to come soon, has become something different. It's a utopia. And what I mean with that is that it has no place. But it is there as a force, as a spiritual force, as an ethical force, maybe as a doctrinal force too. But the key point is that he is present in his promise of the kingdom, which is not a political kingdom anymore. Everybody who says, this is kingdom of Jesus that is coming, what I'm preaching to you is going to fail. I'm telling you this. But his kingdom is still in our midst. So, so this is the spiritual position I'm taking. Then uh, St Stefan mentioned the resurrection of the body. Um, it was not just the body and the soul, but there were in, within the early Christianity several ideas about the body, the risen body of Jesus. And while I'm making the point that the risen Jesus and his body are a mystery, I'm meaning that we have to start with texts that are trying to express quite different, diverse things about the risen Jesus in this bodily context. Let's study Mark. The, the earliest manuscripts are, you know, stop with the empty tomb. The Jesus that is disappeared, and there is a promise that you will see him in Galilee. Later manuscripts are supplementing this by describing the, the appearance of the risen one. Uh, but we don't have, we have his disappearance and his promise to the, the pupils, his, his disciples, that you will see him in Galilee. But they, Mark resists on telling us what happened, or then he had an end 
to the gospel. And somebody was dissatisfied with it, and we have lost it. But the one that we have now in verses chapter 16, verses 9 to 20, that is a later addition to the text, quite incontestably. So we have the case of Mark, that is one. Then we have the case of Matthew, that's another one. There, there is a body of the risen Jesus that is touched by some women who come to the tomb. There is always one woman at the tomb who is common with all the traditions, and it's Mary Magdalene. But the other women change. There are different names and different Gospels. But he is touched. But then what happens when he goes to Galilee, where what Ma Ma Mark tells about and where Matthew has his Galilee appearance. Actually, nothing happens in Jerusalem according to Mark and Matthew. I must correct you in this, because the main thing, the appearance, happens in Galilee in these two Gospels. And, and we don't know the strife between Galilee and Jerusalem is very old in, in, in Christian traditions. And then Jesus comes to his disciples, appears to them, and gives his baptism commandment to baptize everything in his name. And what does he do? Does he go back to heaven? No, he stays in their midst. He stays there. He doesn't leave. And didn't the same Jesus in Matthew say, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst? So, we have two different positions. Disappearance of Jesus, um, the bodily Jesus who stays within his own, even though he hasn't been touched anymore, but his presence is different. He could be touched in the beginning, but now he's not touched, but he stays in their midst. And then we have the position of Luke, which Stefan, I think, is more um, closer to your presentation, that Jesus appears to disciples and they can, in this tube, uh, they can see that he eats fish. He is truly bodily in their presence and then a cloud takes him to the heavens in the beginning of Acts. So here we have a third option and then we have a fourth one in the Gospel of John where Jesus offers his body to the disciples to be touched, but they don't touch him. And Jesus praises those who believe and do not see. And as if, you know, John was, or the fourth evangelist, is underlining this point, he lets Jesus say to the women who come close to him, don't touch me. Noli me tangere. So we have a fourth position about the body of Jesus. Then we have the Gospel of Peter, written in the middle of the 2nd century, where Jesus comes out of the tomb, just like in Matthew, and he says blindfolds, he, he, he's, uh, the, the guardians of the tomb are blinded by his you know, luminosity, and he raises to heavens, and he is 140 kilometers high. You know, from here to, to where? Almost to Helsinki. And his head uh, excels beyond heavens. And this was a holy scripture in, among some monks in Egypt. And this was a Christian imagination in the second century. It was very popular. And even Bishop Serapion, who came down from Antiochia to Rossus to read the Gospels because there was a, a dispute about it, and, and some said it was a, a, a docketist Gospel, he studied it first. It's all right. That's true God's word. It's, it's Gospel. It's Jesus. And then when he went back to Antiochia, he checked it and, well, yes, some docketists have been used this text. No, well, the Gospel of Peter is actually not a docketist text, but it was a disputed Gospel. And, and you can say, Stefan, you might say that the, the four Gospels that we have are the earliest, and there is no dispute about that. I may agree with you. So we have the earliest witness in the four Gospels, but we do not have a single vision about the resurrection body of Jesus. One minute. I had a lot of things to say. All right, but, but everything in, in um, Gospels, everything in Jesus' resurrection is related to Jesus. And there is another thing, which I put shortly, is that everything about recent Jesus is, re, uh, is related um, to, everything is related, everything in Christianity is related to Jesus. 
So Christianity is a belief system. That's why I'm, you know, imposing this mystery aspect on it. Because, you know, they are not provable sentences about Jesus is risen from the dead. I don't see it as a provable sentence because it is related to other sentences in Christianity. You can say that, for example, from the earthly point of view, that Ingmar is Eric's son. And another sentence about Ingmar, Ingmar rose from the dead. But when you say about Jesus, Jesus is God's son and Jesus rose from the dead, you interrelate those two statements and you don't check them separately. Like you can check whether Ingmar, Ingmar rose from the bed. Yes, he's Eric's son. Or actually, Eric thinks he's Eric's son. Yes, but that's good enough for us. Or then, did he rise from the bed? Yes, he did. He didn't have a hangover. He didn't stay there. So there are two separate facts that can be checked. But facts about Jesus are interchangeable, related to each other. And I think this is a problem about the, the proving dimension of Christianity. It's a faith system and not a sort of, you know, um, where historical proof uh, gives us satisfying results. That's actually my starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan, eight minutes. Uh, okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> a lot of things to be uh, uh, discussed and to, to think about and to uh, uh, comment. Uh, let me begin by uh, Mati's last comment about the, the proven version of Christianity. I do not claim that we can prove the existence of God or the identity of Jesus as the Son of God or the resurrection uh, of Jesus from the dead. Uh, we have proof in mathematics. There you can really prove things. In the empirical science, you can, to some degree, uh, prove things. But when we are talking about history, and when we are making metaphysical claims, uh, we have to approach them differently than we approach mathematics or physics. So we cannot prove a position, but we can still look at the evidences and ask what is the best explanation. The best explanation is not the same as a proof, but it is still a reasonable conclusion that out from what we can know, we infer a conclusion, uh, which we give arguments for why this is the best explanation. I totally agree that it is sad when we divorce dogma and ethic, ethics and spirituality. In the Christian faith, they are one package. Notice no one is without dogma. Even if you say, I don't, I don't have a dogma, that becomes your new dogma. So there's no way around having a dogma. So the only thing is that we need to define our dogmas and why we hold that specific dogma for, uh, as true. The Christian dogma, if we think about the confession uh, to Jesus, involves, of, of course, truth claims that he was the son of God and that God uh, raised him from the dead. It includes an ethical challenge to live in a new way. And there is a constant, a spiritual dimension, because Jesus is not the figure of the past, but a living person. He's the risen Christ. He's the Lord who we are waiting to come back bodily, physical, to this world. And now, at the present, if we are his disciples, he is, through his spirit, with us. So in the Christian faith, you keep together dogma and ethics and the, spirit, uh, the spiritual. I do not agree that Jesus belongs to everyone in the sense that we don't have any real knowledge about Jesus, and therefore every group can make up their own picture of Jesus. Fascinating enough, I think we have a reliable tradition from the eyewitnesses, from people who actually knew him and saw him and listened to him. And we have uh, those traditions in the four Gospels, uh, which 
present us to the real person of Jesus. And we have it in the very early traditions, for example, that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Of course, the resurrection is a mystery. There's a lot of things that goes far beyond reason. But it's not only a mystery, it's also a real historical event. And when the first Christians, according to Acts, were preaching this, they, uh, they challenged their hearers about this event. You know this Jesus. So they could refer to common knowledge about this person they now claimed to be uh, risen. Did Jesus believe that the kingdom should, uh, would come in his lifetime? Maybe, but also maybe not. I don't think the evidence are that clear that he expected a kingdom to come in his lifetime. Why? Well, for example, he spoke about the gospel being preached to all the world. They knew quite a lot, even if they didn't know about Australia. They know about India and Africa and, and Europe at that time. That every nation should become disciples and then the end will come. This signals that Jesus had a, a longer perspective than just a few decades. And he was a Jew. And they had lived for centuries with God's promises that constantly were prolonged. They thought, now it will happen, now it will happen, now it will happen. And then it happened further uh, along the history. So in their mindset, they, they had this attitude of a promise from God. It can be fulfilled now, but it can also be fulfilled later on. Because God is God and he has another picture of history. In terms of, and, and this is maybe the key question here, different ideas of the body. I don't agree uh, on that. There is not different ideas of the body of Jesus in the four Gospels. There are different accounts of the resurrection and different amounts of details, but that is not the same as different view of the body. In the book of Mark, of course, we, there are, are this uncertainty about the ending. But before the crucifixion and the empty tomb, Jesus had been talking about the resurrection three times and promised it. And in the Jewish context, this means a bodily resurrection. That is what resurrection means. In Matthew, it does not say that Jesus stayed on the mountain. It does not say what happened after the event when Jesus proclaimed uh, that all might was given to him and he commissioned his disciples. So, but that's not a different view of the body. That is just a different amount of details that the four Gospels are giving to us. Uh, so it is with the lo localization of the appearances that not all of them uh, are uh, telling us about the uh, appearances in Jerusalem, but two of the Gospels uh, do, um, uh, Luke and uh, John. I think it's very interesting that the Gospel writers have not harmonized those most important texts of their Gospels, namely the resurrection texts. And I, I go with N.T. Wright, here, that it is like the resurrection stories have been frozen in a very, very early stage, because this is a kind of holy tradition, and therefore there are no reference to scripture, or fulfillment of scripture. Uh, I think that is the main reason why they are not harmonized, is, or they are not filling out the, the picture. Uh, it is that they have been frozen at a very early stage. I find that a better explanation than that the Christians had very different ideas about the resurrected body of Jesus. Yes, I, I think there were some, uh, you know, misunderstandings or different understandings, but I think there is also a... A true diversity in views, and, and I think this. What I'm making you a bit difficult is that my approach is is in cooperation to other opponents that you may have a bit too personal and and, and a bit too uh, long to explain. But I'll try to put it short. 
So I am not hearing you saying that you are proving the resurrection of Jesus. I am hearing you saying just precisely what you say is that this is the best option. But for me, the whole question about <coughs> trying to apologize that in some way, for me, that as a project is not viable because for me, the resurrection of Jesus is mystery from a start. Uh, I think the main thing about, you know, when you come to faith or when you uh, become a Christian, it's through baptism or conversion or whatever it is. It's about your personal world. Either it's your parents' choice and their Christian education on you, or you um, come to a stage in your life where you're posing questions about yourself, about your future, about right and wrong, about what to believe and so on. And then, without any evidence at all, you choose to believe. So faith starts on a quite different level than, than what we are talking about, that you are talking about here. It's not something that, well, maybe you can prove this. Well, if you believe this, then you can believe that, and so on. We can make a case for this. I'm not living in that discourse, because I, I don't find it fruitful. Um, I think, you know, I'm putting spirituality first. And this is sort of, you know, novelty in my position, probably. And it's, I'm not saying I'm a spiritual person more spiritual than you. It's nonsense. I'm saying that there are some quick questions that everybody bears. And they are mostly questions that are not articulated. And there are unpolitical questions. They are, there is nothing to fight about your mortality. There is nothing to fight about your loneliness and emptiness and that which is all pervasive in our lives. There is more than being a sinner and a righteous. And this is in, in the work of some, spir some spiritual works and it's truly biblical, is that before we were born, we were not. We were not to each other, nothing to each other, nothing to this world. And when we die, we are forgotten. And we live for eternity or God or, if you're an atheist, for nothing. And that is bigger. That's the big question. Not our political fight about having the right thing to say. I am chief redactor of Vartia. And there was a very fierce article about what people are doing on Sunday in Helsinki. And he was very worried about people's Sunday business some hundred years ago. Well, he's dead now, and so is Helsinki where he lived in, but that was what he as a Christian was very worried about. Now we are worried about different things, and people after hundred years are worried about some other things that do not are any of our concern. So I think the point is the spiritual question is always beyond. It's always bigger than the political or apologetical or dogmatical fight of everything. That's why I put it in the first place. And when I'm, I'm very thankful that you try to understand what I say about mystery, because mystery is, is not a sort of excuse, because my, maybe my worst enemies are the liberals, where I actually camp myself, is that they are saying, well, you are trying to just take a few steps back because you cannot really believe, but in, in the reality you don't believe anything. But I think the, the, the key point of the gospel lives in all those 2,000 years in, in the spiritual settings that we have. They change a bit, but there are some unchangeable things. Our humanity, our mortality, our emptiness, our loneliness, that we come naked, we leave naked, and so on. That there are spirit, these are spiritual questions, and these are the heavy questions. And everything else is peanuts, or bullshit, if you like. So these are the heavy spiritual questions that we are really trading with when we are talking about political. When people come together and pray together, they are talking to each other mostly, not to God. I find that very hypocrite. That you are sending message about me being very humble and very Christian to the others, and you are actually not talking to God. What did Jesus say about prayer? Go alone in your chamber and pray there. That's what he said. And we are not doing that. So it's, 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 it's about this basic spiritual radical nakedness of human beings. That's, that's what I'm actually, where I relate Jesus' resurrection to and his kingdom, is that his kingdom has become a utopia, 
Once you put it in political preaching, you say, you know, Trump or Middle Eastern events or so on, Jesus is coming, when you end up in disappointment. That has happened for 2,000 years, and people have made stupid of themselves with that. Fanatical and stupid and so on. And I'm not saying we shouldn't follow politics. Of course, for a Christian, it's very good to be keen in politics, but you cannot make gain any profit for your faith from politics, because then you lose your faith, actually. So, um, I'm, Jesus belongs to everybody. That's an empirical fact. Now, who controls the talk about Jesus? Churches, or your apologetical centrum, or Lutherans, or the Catholics, or the Pope, or that Archbishop over there, who has in his, you know, I have Jesus here. All right, I think you would say, Stefan, I put it positively that all Christians who have the same basic confession about the main things, about, you know, what Bible says, what the confessions say, they can talk with each other and do a mission. And I, I find that's a reasonable position. You, just a bit ecumenical, maybe not too much, but you can say that... Uh, this works. Well, it might work. That's good. But talking about universal Jesus is that the, the talk about Jesus is, you know, this has been disseminated, you know, through Christian mission and Christian culture so much that we are even as Christians who have a very specific position in this modern world. We have to debate about things previous generation of Christians didn't know anything about. And that's something we cannot hide ourselves with that. And so it was an empirical statement. I'm not telling you that, but you know, whom he truly belongs to is, an, is a mystical question. And that's, that's a mystery. You know, we must always look upon Jesus as something that is ours in a way that it does, it, it's not, nobody is excluded from him when, when I have Jesus. And that's a mystery too. Because others are humans too. So um, I sympathize with the idea that, that the resurrection of Jesus, in comparison to many other miracles, was something that happened and was witnessed very soon after that happened. I think there is something you can start with. I would disagree with on some points with um, on on the interpretation of the gospels, because there are so many um, differences between the Gospels and so many discrepancies in the traditions. Uh, where I truly disagree is that, that the, the kingdom of God was, that Jesus' vision was that the kingdom was coming soon. So otherwise he wouldn't have been so enthusiastic about the kingdom in Galilee. Because if you say, well, kingdom of God is coming soon, believe me, believe that God comes. So, not actually. He may come after 2,000 years, but I'm telling you, he comes soon. Well, it doesn't make a very plausible setting to me. So, if you take Jesus and his audience, Jesus the prophet, and his audience in Galilee seriously, then you cannot have a philosophical Jesus above all times saying, well, maybe later. No, it was not later. It was then concretely. And his parables are very concrete. And that's where, where, where we genuinely agree, disagree. And then I think the, the talk about body is what I'm trying to point at. It's there are full of metaphoric tensions in the Gospels. That in Matthew you can touch Jesus' body, but then somehow while he doesn't disappear, he, Matthew gives a hint. No, you see, he stays with us as he stayed with, he stayed with them. So there is a metaphoric hint about him. So these, they are narratives, not philosophical tracts. So it's, it's about Jesus who is, um, the, the evangelist is, is insinuating something. Is thinking, oh, maybe how you should think about Jesus, because he cannot cope the question in a very convincing way. You cannot put it easily in a story. Luke does it actually, but he has the, the cloud and the heavens where Jesus goes. The cloud comes like a taxi and takes Jesus to heavens. And that's the old worldview. Thank you. And uh, Stefan, uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs>
<laughs> Jesus was proclaiming that the kingdom is coming, and he did that very enthusiastically. But he also with held the rumor that he was the Messiah because the people had this political vision of what the kingdom uh, would be. And he constantly talked about, I need to go to Jerusalem and there I will die for the sins of my people and I will be resurrected. So I think there's a lot of, uh, of aspects of Jesus' ministry that shows that he did not share his contemporaries' view of the kingdom. He had a different view of the kingdom. I think one of the main differences between us is that when I listen to you, I interpret you as an existentialist. It seems to me, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that you have accepted a lot of the Enlightenment project, which means that the only option for a religious perspective is to make it into a mystical perspective, because rationally, there is no opening for God or the spiritual. Therefore, you have to find the existential opening for the faith. I don't share in the Enlightenment project. So therefore, I am open for uh, God intervening into history. Of course, there will be a lot of mystery aspects with that, but it will also be real history, and therefore there will also be real evidences. In terms of the Gospel of John, where uh, Jesus says to Mary, don't touch me, I forgot to uh, just comment on that. It's very important that we don't read half the statement, don't touch me. Jesus is motivating why this is the case. Because I am going to my Father. He's referring to the ascension. And uh, it seems that what Mary is expressing is that she wants to hold on to Jesus. The problem is not the touching, as if Jesus was a kind of fragile, don't touch me because I will break, but he, she wanted to keep Jesus and she had to inform her that I will not be with you physically, no, I have to go to my father first. And then this whole period of the Gentiles being invited into the kingdom will come. And that is the period we are living in now, if the resurrection is real, there is one point in history where new life has come into this history of death. And we as Christians, our task is to proclaim this wonderfully good news that everyone on this planet Earth can be connected to the living Lord and receive this new kind of life, eternal life, through him. And then we're waiting that Jesus will come back from, from heaven to establish the kingdom he first preached in Galilee. And uh, he will establish that as an eternal kingdom on a new created heaven and earth. There, there will be no sorrow and no evil and no death because he has, through his death and resurrection, defeated all those enemies. And therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is not an interesting historical point it's crucial for the future and for everyone living on planet Earth today. Uh, three minutes. All right. Um, I think um, in the Gospel of Mark, which is the oldest gospel, we have Jesus telling about his, you know, predicting his crucifixion and resurrection only to the disciples, not to the crowds. So, in, Ma in Mark, there is an interesting problem. Jesus is very successful in Cal Galilee. Everybody comes to him. He does miracles. He feeds the 5,000 and all the rest of it. And then, poof, suddenly everything vanishes. He says to the disciple, whoa, I have to go to, the Jer to Jerusalem. And I'm getting myself crucified and then I rise from the dead. And then I send you back and you proclaim. So, there is this uneasiness in this story to combine the two things. Jesus is very, very, very successful mission in Galilee, which is actually not a mission of the kingdom, but sort of preparation where people have to be misguided, they have to misunderstand him, Mark 4, out, those outside. They are just uh, flabbergasted about Jesus, but they should not believe because they don't know. How could they know? Because this Jesus doesn't preach in Galilee in a way that, well, kingdom of God is coming. All right, it's coming. Maybe then, maybe later. 
But first, I'm getting myself crucified, and then I'm risen, rising from the dead, and then I send to you people who come with the same message, including the package that I was crucified and I was risen. So there is this uneasy construction in the gospel, and it depends on the traditions that the evangelist had. And Mark did the best of it. It's a very good gospel. The problem is that the earthly Jesus and the risen Jesus are not of the same mold. And I think it's, it's simple as that. Because earthly Jesus preached the kingdom and the risen Jesus has a wider message which includes the kingdom. And so, therefore, Paul had a simple solution. Earthly Jesus is not included. It's just the risen Jesus. Crucified and risen, that's it. So, in early Christianity, we have this eternal tension between those two. And then, um, I'm actually, um, I think uh, enlightenment is part of our society, and I think we can agree on many things that you think that we work with when we are talking about medicine and natural sciences, enlightenment is very good, and so on, but not in the matters of faith. But I think it, we, I, I would go farther than that. So I think that our discourses are not directly dependent purely on enlightenment, but also what came after that, romanticism and idealism. And, and that's something we want to hide from the site, that there is in our discourse, there is not just a rational thing, but we are putting the faith as a sort of personal thing inside us, and it has a mystical relation, yes, to the whole. And, and the rational discourse that you are making is, is part of that romantical idealistic world just as is mine. So the problem is world has changed and we change with the world. And we, we cannot imitate orthodoxy or pietism of the 17th century. Which I would, you know, if I, I would you know, try to make you laughable, I would say, well, he's just, you know, traditionalist. No, it's not just that. But, but, but time, time changes us a bit, too. Um, I had a point, I have to stop here, but I, I had a point about, about this noli me tangere. It's not that Mary was keeping Jesus, because it's, 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 it's that it's not physical then when Jesus comes back. There is no coming back of Jesus in the Gospel of John. It's, the problem is that, that they are very, um, there is a later redaction in the Gospel of John. And you don't believe there is a later redaction. But the problem is that, that the, the original Gospel has a very straightforward way that the person who believes in Jesus is living already. He has already risen. He has life in himself. And, and there is no, no, actually not. There is a very straightforward present eschatology in the Gospel of John. And you cannot dim that with adding the, the, the second coming of Jesus. But I think there is a true disagreement about the reduction of the Gospel of John. Yes, thank you so much, both of you. And uh, now uh, the time has come for questions for you, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, oh, there is one question. And please indicate uh, to whom you are putting your question. Okay, this question is for Martin. If I understand correctly, your view it is that the mystery of the resurrection makes the question of the historical bodily physical resurrection not important. Am I correct? Mm. Uh, yes, I may formulate that, that more clearly. It's, I think the problem is that we have so much metaphorical language in the Gospels and among the original witnesses that we cannot separate the metaphors that they used from the historical reality that they pointed at. So we, we have the interplay between the two, and so we cannot focus on the historical side, but we have to take their witness in this, you know, metaphorical understanding of resurrection. So when we, we shouldn't, we should understand them in their context. They had a worldview that was different than ours. Okay. And, it's, it, and, and it's related to that. And I wouldn't approach that worldview as a sort of, you know, in an atheistic way, saying, well, 
because these people had this worldview, they believed in the gospel, in the resurrection of Jesus in a naive way. So we should discard the whole resurrection. Or then we should say, which is correct, by the way, that there are, you know, these uh, post-mortem appearances <coughs> of the spouses, to, for example, or close friends. And, and, for example, a widow sees his departed husband a few days after he's dead, and, and things is discussed, dialoguing, and, and there is a study in, in Harvard University, which Gerd Ludemann points at, who is an atheist, Gerd Ludemann, who has studied the resurrection stories, he says that, well, this explains the whole thing. Yeah. He, and and, and I, I, what I am saying, you, you are always, what happens re really is that when you talk about resurrection of Jesus, you have everything involved about Jesus and yourself and about Christianity and the rest of the world. So, so it's a sort of big issue, and it's not a sort of analytical issue, but we should co understand it better. And I'm not um, trying to fade away from the questions that are... That's yeah. just a preliminary question yeah. to get to the real question. Mm. Okay, it's metaphorical rather than non-important, I understand. Mm. The real question is, I'd like to understand how you would situate your view uh, compared to first century views as mm. far as we have written, for example, uh, that the others contrast or uh, agree with the view that we find in the writings of Luke or Paul. And mm. just like not go into a lot of detail, but just to give a general idea yeah. of your view in the first century context. Well, so when we approach, uh, well, this is very tentative. Uh, when we approach the first disciples of Jesus seeing him after his death. So this actually the point is that he often, Jesus let himself to be seen by his disciples. That's the way to put it. But basically the idea is that they saw him. So seeing Jesus is related to everything about their human feelings, thoughts, and their state of mind. Everything. Not just, you know, that it was a sort of, you know, I wouldn't narrow it down to sort of, because they were, you know, desperate about him and they didn't, they, he died and they were so disillusioned. They somehow, they were confused and their mind developed this sort of thing that has been studied. You know, when you have traumatic post-mortem stress order, you know, sort of, you know, when somebody dies, you may be stressed and you see things. You know, I wouldn't explain it like that. I would relate it to everything in their identity. And, I, and there is a word that I haven't mentioned before, is that faith is about identity. It's the identity formation of the first Christians, and it's related to everything they experienced about Jesus. And that's why when we talk about faith and spirituality, it is not about just about brute historical facts. I wouldn't narrow it down to history or psychology or dogmatics or anything. But you should be elusive in that and see, in order to understand them, because they are object of our understanding, we should give them, you know, a fair space of living in their lives where they were. And at the same time, see where we are and see what combines us. And actually there I would hint at the spirituality being something that builds the bridge always between the times. Not dogmatics, not ethics, but always spirituality. And I would, I, I would just give it the first violin to spirituality and the two second violins to dogma and ethics. That's, that's my point. Okay, and, uh, Stephen, you want to comment? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the whole question of metaphor is very important. And one needs, of course, when, when reading texts from antiquity and uh, we're thinking of biblical texts, one needs to be open for the concept of metaphor. But then one needs to argue why a certain expression or concept in a specific text actually is a metaphor. We are not free just to impose this is a metaphor uh, just randomly. And I would say there's nothing in the New Testament that indicates uh, that the belief in the resurrection of Jesus was uh, a metaphor. If we, if we read 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is uh, quoting this very, very early tradition that we can trace back to the 30s, he speaks very straightforward about, uh, about the resurrection. For if dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. 
And then he goes on to list six consequences if Christ was not risen. And then he states, but indeed, God raised Jesus from the dead. And there's nothing uh, there that is uh, metaphorical. In terms of Jed Ludeman, I think that's a very interesting um, uh, hypothesis he has about the resurrection, that it was like a vision that a, um, uh, for example, a husband who has lost uh, his wife has a, a vision of the uh, deceased wife. It's, it's a very common phenomenon. They knew it in antiquity, we know it today. But it's very weak as an explanation of the actual events. Why? Firstly, there is no explanation of why the tomb was empty. If this explanation is true, then there is a dead corpse that everyone can go to in the tomb. You cannot explain away the corpse by referring to a vision. Secondly, no one is changed for life by having a vision of one's deceased wife. Everyone understands. This is just psychology. I'm mourning and my brain is repicturing <coughs> my beloved for me. Uh, so I, I don't think that's a very strong explanation for, uh, uh, for the resurrection, uh, to uh, view it as that kind of vision. And, and thirdly, the testimonies from the people who had the, uh, the appearances is not that of a vision, except for Paul. The others are not speaking in visionary terms, so it does not do justice to the historical material we have. So I think Ludemann actually is guided by his atheistic presupposition that he from the start knows that no resurrection can take place and therefore there must be another explanation how bad it, uh, it can be uh, really a bad one, it's always better than resurrection because resurrection is out of the picture because of his atheistic presuppositions. Okay, one more question over here. Uh, I remember uh, Alfred Lewis, he also talked about this, that uh, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom and then came the first. But uh, in Matthew 16, 18, it, it says that uh, you are Peter and upon this book I will build my church. And then he says, and I give you the keys of the kingdom. So could there be uh, uh, ecclesiastical aspect of the kingdom and or is this uh, later interpretation? Yes, the problem. Should I repeat? I think it was a clear question. Uh, well, uh, now at this stage of debate we, we end up with the uh, interpretation of traditions behind the gospel. So Stephen is closer to the position that everything that's written in the gospels is really said and done by Jesus. Everything. And when you end up in, you know, four versions, then you probably wouldn't go in a harmonistic way like the fundamentalist that there were four blind men around Jericho and so on. You wouldn't do that. But you would do something more sensible, but, but something like that, that, you know, in where you can harmonize, just do it. There were, you know, the star and the 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 magi, the, the the wise men from the east, and there were the shepherds and angels. Everything was there. Not so that we take Matthew separately, Luke separately, tradition separately, but we actually could write a gospel harmony. And, and that's one point. You know, I wouldn't do it. I don't know what's your stand about it, but but I think even when we go to your question, it is it's a good legible question, is that you know if you see the same thing in, in the Gospel of Mark is different. Yes, and then and then then Matthew redacted it and he had a separate tradition that was an interpretation of the text of Matthew Mark, which was very hard actually because Peter there, you know, misunderstood Jesus completely as the disciples always do in the Gospel of Mark, accepting <laughs> other things like the end of the world. You know, it's a mixture of misunderstanding and understanding. Mark is held together by a story, not by logics, because there are lots of tensions, and they are very fruitful tensions. I have an explanation for them, but let's, let's leave that aside. One thing, um, I don't think Jesus is 
uh, resurrection is, was a metaphor. I think it's a mystery. So what, what I think, I relate mystery to everything. And, and my way of seeing this as mystical thing is, is not reducing things and saying, and then say, well, 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 let's stop this. It's unpleasant. Uh, my way of doing it is that, that life itself is a mystery. And, and as a Christian, it's my identity building factor. And if, if I explain to a Muslim what is my faith, I can say, this is my identity. This is who I am. They come from a different place, different, uh, different uh, faith and different time and so on. They are, people are different by backgrounds. And we can, we can speak of ourselves. We cannot speak of, our, of the others. But we can touch the others by sharing something in common with them and convince them through humanity. And the first Christians mostly convince the other by see how they love one another. Nowadays we can say how see how they hate each other, uh, but it's you know I want to say, just go to your chamber and pray your God there. All right, but that's what Jesus is to me. All right, but 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 I think it's it's basically basically I think that um, the key matters of faith are are mysteries, but I think they are mysteries related to the life we live every day, every day and not mysteries related to rational discourses that go right or wrong. So that's, that's my point. And, and I'm, I'm not an existentialist. I'm not an existentialist. I think it's important that we, uh, we make a distinction in terms of what kind of, of issues we are actually discussing here. This is not a debate on, uh, on the view of the Bible or the infallibility of the Bible. Uh, and I have not assumed anything uh, like that in my uh, uh, in my presentation here. I've just referred to what the majority of scholars accept, that the, the tomb was empty, that the first disciples had appearances, which they interpreted as uh, Jesus was alive, and that that started the Christian church. Uh, notice here that we can reconstruct history also from Met, uh, from uh, literary sources which have errors in them. So, for example, you study Josephus. He's not correct on every point. There are errors in Josephus, quite a number of them. And he is exaggerating his material and so on. And, and everyone would agree on that. He's not infallible <coughs> or, or inerrant. But we can still reconstruct very important part of history from antiquity. It's, of course, the same with the Gospels. That even if the Gospels are not inerrant or infallible, we can still reconstruct important part of history. And this debate is not about are the Gospels infallible or not. That's a separate debate. I would love to have that too, but we have that on another day. This is a debate on did Jesus uh, uh, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? And we don't need infallible documents in order to be able to reconstruct what happened after the execution of Jesus. It's enough that we have ordinary documents from antiquity. And the gospel qualifies at least to that kind of documents. Thank you very much so far. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Milukowski. Um, I like it very much that you emphasize the spiritual and um, you, uh, uh, you emphasize that uh, the spiritual questions start when all the others have been treated and that happens when, uh, when everything else is gone and you're alone and that's, correct me if I missed some yes, you, yes. that's where you meet Jesus. And uh, you've, um, you came back on that twice even. So I wanted to ask, uh, have you yourself experienced that situation in your life? And can you tell us something about your experience? Yes, I, it's, it's not a sort of supernatural experience or anything. I would, um, it's not excess existential because existential philosophy is, is a very mixed bag. That's another session too. Actually, existential, existentialism started as a for, form of national socialism. So it's not very... 
So, so and, and it was uh, interpreted in various ways. But what I'm pointing at is that actually my view on spirituality has developed as a believer. And it is basically, uh, it, it comes out of uh, the dissatisfaction with debates and wars on religion and with the, uh, all kinds of, you know, hypocritical... Um, my problem has always been the community, not the Bible. So, so how people treat each other in Christian communities. That's my Achilles heel, actually, where, where this starts. And, and there, actually, my views on spirituality are not individualistic. That's a conclusion that some of you may draw on the basis of what I said. No, they are generic. So it's basically that we are human beings. It's what is same in you and me and everybody here in this room and, and for that matter, outside also. So is that w what is the core of uh, humanness? What is there? You know, it's basically in existentialism, you have some points of that, but, but this is Bultmann's existentialism. Heidegger's existentialism was different. It was Bultmann actually, and I, I am, Impressed and influenced by Bultmann, but I'm, I'm not a Bultmannian. Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah. maybe my question was not clear, because I uh, tried to ask about this moment or situation in which you are alone, yeah. in which all the other Christians are not yeah. anymore, and, and that place where you can actually meet Jesus. Yeah. And so I'd like to ask, have you experienced that? Uh, can you tell us about that? Experience I, I, experience, I experience that, that God is the big question. There is, actually, I feel sympathy for the Orthodox faith where there is priority for God. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in the Trinity below him. But that is sort of theological view. But, but what I think is that God is there and, and I meet actually God in Jesus. You know, what is interesting in New Testament is that, that there is this metaphorical talk which has a clear focus, uh, though, that we are in Jesus and he is in us. We have Paul saying that he is in Christ. And in John, Jesus says, you are in me. So, so we have this union that is spiritual. And that is, that is our identity as Christians. And when I experience the solitude of life, then I'm experiencing it with Jesus, who is my identity. And I'm facing God, who is actually father of all. So as a Christian, I believe, in, I, fa I believe in Jesus, but as a human being, I uh, face the one, the, the you know, God that is in, re in all religions, but also in our tradition. And also, we can talk with atheists about how they face those things. And you can talk in, in peace and quiet with an atheist how he th what he thinks about emptiness or death and so on, about solitude. And it's, it's, it's a de reasonable discussion, because that's a question of meanings, when, when we have a point where there is no meaning after all. There is just emptiness, the empty space. And so, so that's, I, I, maybe the, the, my response, which is not so clear, is that, I, I hope it's clear, is that I, I think that the role of Jesus is different than the role of God. And I think it's biblical. I'm, I'm not sure that I will sound uh, a little bit decent or maybe uh, my question would be somehow be even a little bit ignorant because uh, I am Muslim and uh, how to say and my question is about the uh, human nature of Jesus about like uh, because as far as I know in Christianity it says like Jesus has both divine and human nature and uh, if like and in Islam it's only about the human nature and uh, how how to say uh, what would what is the perspective or the meanings of uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from this point of view, like um, because what is the human nature of Jesus in Christianity? That's that's my question, and what that means uh, for the uh, value of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And your question is directed to both or to uh, to, to both okay. actually. To both to I, I hope that you understand my question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for an, an important question. Um, uh, Christians and, and Muslims, we of course uh, share a number of aspects uh, in our belief in God and also uh, in our belief in Jesus that he was uh, sent. Uh, from God, and uh, we therefore hold him in high uh, regard and we respect him. But there's also huge differences that, according to the Muslim uh, tradition, uh, uh, Jesus was not crucified, he was not executed, but Allah uh, uh, helped him to escape, and someone else was uh, crucified in his place, and he was taken up directly to heaven. So he did not die and he was not resurrected. Uh, according to the Christian faith, he did die. And his death was an atonement for sin, so um, uh, there was meaning in his death. He died for us, and God uh, resurrected him from the dead and glorified him. So that's a huge difference. But this difference is also goes back to the nature of Jesus, which you, you were talking about. And this, in turn, goes back to how we view God and God's relationship to his creation. I think here is a major difference that in Islam, Allah is so transcendent and so different that he has another relationship to his creation than in Christianity. In Christianity, God is of course transcendent, but he's also imminent and he is uh, also close to human being in another way. So he has created us in his image, a concept which is not part of Islam. Uh, so already from the beginning, we are closer to God being his image. Uh, and the whole vocabulary in the two religions are different. So in Islam, you can become the servant of Allah and obey him. In Christianity, you can become the child of God, the daughter and the son of God. And the, uh, the Christian faith ends, if you read it at the end of, of the Gospels, with a wedding of Christ and his church. So it's very intimate pictures of the relationship between God and his people. And that is aligned through the whole faith from the beginning in the Bible to the end that God really wants to have a reciprocal, a, a real relationship of communion and love with us, which differs from the Muslim view where God is above us and we can enter paradise maybe, but we do not enter into this kind of love relationship with, uh, with uh, God. And the incarnation stands here as the proof in the Christian faith of how God wants to be close to us. So he creates us in his image, therefore there is a form into which he can come. We are already his image. And then in Jesus Christ, uh, he becomes a human being and assumes a human nature, never to leave that. So Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven as a human being. Also a divine being, but he was also had a human nature and he will come back as a human person. So I think here's a, a huge difference between the co two conceptions of God and of man and of Jesus. And for me, the, the evidence that the Christian conception is true, is the right one, is the resurrection. If one can show that the most reasonable explanation of what has happened in history is that God resurrected Jesus, then God himself has confirmed this whole storyline for us. That, that is how Paul uh, talks about it in Acts 17, that, that God has proved this for everyone by, by raising him from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus is proof of the identity of Jesus that he actually was both human and divine. 
Yeah, so what the only difference, uh, you know, um, that was a good survey of, of the differences between Muslim faith and Christian faith. And in general, I think many Christians would agree from the point of history and dogmatics and so on. But maybe the key difference between us is I, I don't think we can provide a, a plausible or, let's say, believable explanation of Jesus' resurrection in an analytical way. I don't, I don't think that we can uh, go to the historical, natural historical core of resurrection and say, here we have it, or this is plausible or so. But I think that when faith starts in us, you know, and, and, and I think this is common with all faiths, that faith is a matter of uh, us being humans with all human capacities. And when faith starts in someone, it is not related to the scientific uh, veracity of the faith claims, because they always come afterward. And they are part of a, a sort of marginal, you know, specific discourse, and not the common discourse of faith. Here, uh, just to add something here, because we have come back to this point a number of times. I totally agree that for most people and for most Christian, faith does not start with an intellectual inquiry into the uh, existence of God or the historicity of Jesus. Faith starts uh, differently. And for most people, you, you receive faith from your context, your family, your culture, your friends, your upbringing. We are social beings and we take over. Uh, what is around us. And th that's the reason why um, most people in Italy are uh, Catholics and most people in Texas are evangelicals and most people in India are Hindus and so forth and so on. That's, uh, that's just how we work. We take over what, what our parents and our surrounding has. But becoming a mature human being, we need to examine what was given to us through our childhood, through our family, through our culture, and see what of this is true and good and healthy, and what is false and destructive. And you need to get rid of things that were planted into your life through your context. That goes for all of us, because no one of us has lived in a perfect family in a perfect context, in a perfect society. So one needs to go back and see, okay, I believe this, why? Is this true? Is this good? Is this healthy? Can it stand up to scrutiny? I shouldn't continue to believe just because I had a belief started in me when I was a kid or a teenager or I was together with some very dynamic person and I, sh and I shared their perspective. I need to start to questioning my own background and my own faith in order to embrace what I as an adult are convinced is really true. So for me, the truth issue here is very important and challenge everyone regardless of our background or culture. I think we are now with uh, question Is there any more questions? One point to make is, is uh, that there are just there is a variety of discourses like that, and it's they are not always about the truth, it's the true good and the beautiful. There are different discourses in different mixtures about the basis of faith. People looking back in the history, looking in the world of thought, whether you know my faith can hold water or not, and it's a very specific question. Very specific question, but I, my faith is is uh, best when it is lived, in a in a way that it it's uh, where my thoughts and my feelings and everything in me is in dialogue with each other, and I'm not not focusing on, on one particular side of faith, but that is that is one approach, and there are many. So I think you are doing important work in you know among people who have these questions, among Christians who have these questions and who want to have a dialogue. I think that's, that's all right. I have nothing against it. I'm just saying that there are other ways too of, of uh, searching yourself and looking your past, looking, your, looking on your faith and, and being critical. And if there are no more questions, 
then uh, you both have the possibility now to say some final, make some final points, uh, say a couple of minutes each. That is, if that's okay. If you don't have anything more to add, uh, it's fine. But you have this possibility. I have a small question. I have heard that Jesus was uh, thrown in a mass grave. Is it true that you yes. have pointed that? Yes, I, I, I still think that this is probably the the best explanation of the traditions and I didn't enter the discussion about the, the interpretation of gospel traditions but it's it's too detailed and it goes into explaining lots of different things there but what, what I then did not intend and what some people in, meant I was intending was that Jesus was not risen but what I was exploring back then and later on even more is that there are various forms of resurrection faith and various conceptions of resurrection body in the early Christianity. And it is not the question of the, you know, question of resurrection flesh and resurrection body. And these are, you know, the behavior of the resurrection body of Jesus is different. And, and we, we were discussing part of that already. So uh, anytime I can get back to this and we can have a sort of exegetical debate on something, but but it is related to everything uh, I else believe. But this is just, you know, th there is scholarly discussion on the Gospels. And it can never be identical with the faith that somebody has. There is a re relation, but it's not always, you know, sort of that, that you have to end up with specific conclusions if you have certain faith or the scientific inquiry leads to necessarily to certain conclusions concerning your faith. I think they are always, there is always tension and interrelation between those two. But this was, this is not a very, let's say, Alfred Luasi thought that way too, he was mentioned here. He's one of my favorite biblical scholars. He's brilliant. I think you wouldn't like him. <laughs> I know. Uh, his commentary on Acts, which is very, it's, it's not known. I would advertise it. It's, it's in French, but it's, it's brilliant thousand pages, brilliant analysis. Uh, he thought that way. There are, there are many critical people with whom I agree, and many spiritual people with whom I agree on Christianity. Do you want to... Uh, do you want to... Now, this is my final... Uh, read Alfred Luasi. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <clears throat> I think I stand up. Uh, in in terms of doing history and try to uh, uh, to understand what happened in antiquity, I think we should give priorities to the sources. And and uh, I think we have a very strong case for the burial of Jesus that he was not thrown into a mass grave because we have the Christian sources, several of them, describing the burial, and we have Josephus, who was a non-Christian, a Jew, a Jew who was critical towards the Christian movement, describing how the Jews at the time handled uh, crucified people, that they were buried the same day. Therefore, all the historical material we have point in one direction. And I would say there are no historical material that point in the, the, the direction of Jesus being thrown into a mass grave. So I think uh, that, that is a, quite a weak, weak position, actually. I quoted you, the, the Josephus, uh, for you earlier. Maybe we should not go into this, it, we shouldn't go into this debate. If a thousand people die at the same day, the mass grave is the only solution. You, you cannot, even though it's easy to, you know, it takes one day, or let's say half a day, to make a grave in the, in the limestone. All right, it's, it's not, in, you can make a simple grave, like in the Gospel of Mark, not in the later, like in the later Gospels. Uh, you cannot be prepared for such a catastrophe as, as wars and famines and diseases provide. And then you have to put them routinely in mass graves. And the same, same, thing with this, same thing with the criminals. The Jewish, Jewish uh, leaders respected the body and they put it in a grave. It doesn't say what kind of graves they were using, but it was a sort of, you know, if you put a rebel in a grave, in a grave it's, it's better to put him in an unknown grave than in a grave where his uh, followers can start a new rebellion. 
Sorry, that was my, my fault. I, I should sorry. have. Uh, I was too tempted. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, yes, I, 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 I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought that up. I'm also Let, tempted to go into this because yeah. I recently wrote an article about this which I could uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's leave that, that subject. And I, I would just very shortly refer you to Acts 26, which, which I think is a very interesting passage uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, relating to our topics. There Paul stands before the governor Festus and the Jewish uh, King Agrippa and uh, his sister Bernice uh, is there and uh, Festus wants to interrogate Paul in order to understand what uh, the Jewish leaders are actually accusing him for. And uh, you have this uh, wonderful banquet uh, banquet with all the famous and uh, rich people of uh, Caesarea is there, and Paul is giving a, uh, a chance to, to defend himself and explain his life and his beliefs and why he is accused. And of course he tells his story, how he persecuted the church, uh, and then how he met the living Lord outside Damascus, and how he was commissioned as an apostle to preach the good news, and then he goes through what the good news is. Uh, and uh, and the good news uh, is uh, that, uh, uh, that Christ would suffer, that he would, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and that he would pro proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. When it comes to this point of Christ being resurrected, Festus interrupts him with a loud voice. Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But Paul responded, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but, I, but what I say is true and reasonable. It is true that God raised Jesus, and it's reasonable. There's nothing in reason that goes against that. And then he turns to the king Agrippa, who is a Jew, and he starts to talk about history. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, know these things. For I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. So it was public events with Jesus. And the, the king knows about Jesus and his execution and what has happened. So here Paul is saying that the belief in resurrection is true, it's reasonable, and it's historical grounded. And actually Agrippa is not protesting, but saying, you almost make me into a Christian. He's not protesting against this description of the events. So I think we have a very coherent pictures in the New Testament about the uh, resurrection and that the first Christians saw it as true and reasonable and not done in a secret, mysterious way only, but something that was open to investigation. And I still, and I th uh, think it's still open to investigation Think, since we have the historical sources, and that we still can dig into history to <coughs> see, is this really true? If it's true, there is, of course, an existential dimension that Jesus is the living Lord who speaks now and uh, who wants to call us to himself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for your participation this uh, afternoon, this evening. And especially thank you, uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, Stefan and Matti, and uh, also to everybody who, who contributed uh, with the arrangements and also the extra arrangements that, that uh, were necessary. And uh, now please remember to fill in these, uh, these um, uh, feedback papers and leave them here somewhere here uh, before, before uh, leaving. And as was mentioned earlier, <coughs> this discussion will be uh, available on YouTube and also on the website veritasforum.fi. And thank you so much to everybody and good evening. <laughs>